thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Don Baptiste. I lead product development and strategy for Bloomberg Government. We are thrilled to be hosting you today for this panel discussion with the Capital Bay Group and Tech America. Uh, over 30 years ago, uh, Bloomberg started and we've grown from a single product, the Bloomberg Terminal, delivering real-time bond prices to the indispensable information resource for about 300,000 financial professionals worldwide. Over two and a half years ago, we began to consider serving the Washington marketplace. We wanted to leverage those core competencies of data, analytics, news, and community to quantify and highlight the business implications of government actions and provide a robust set of tools that would help our clients make better, faster decisions. Today, it's a big aspiration. We're off to a great start. Every day, we're creating proprietary, unique content that addresses the issues that are critical to both business and government leaders. In fact, I'd say our super committee uh, analysis and budget analysis has been second to none. Every two weeks, we're releasing new product functionality based on our client feedback to help them assess the vast amounts of government data available. Washington is incredibly important to Bloomberg, and Bloomberg government is a very strong sign of our long-term commitment to this marketplace. There's a number of folks in the back here, if you have any questions on Bloomberg government, that are wearing these nice orange tags that you can ask them. We have a great panel set up today for a really important discussion on the economy. Kevin Richards from Tech America is going to introduce our panelists and also moderate our discussion. Thank you. Well, um, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, Bloomberg Government for hosting today's session and uh, to our, our partners at uh, Capital Bay Group. Um, I'm Kevin Richards, Senior Vice President of Federal Government Affairs for uh, Tech America. And uh, as many of you know, uh, there's been much speculation around the uh, Super Committee. And the ramifications of that uh, decision uh, will um, reverberate throughout financial and capital markets around the world. Um, I think today's session is very timely. Um, you know, the current state of the economy, ramifications of the Super Committee, capital markets, government spending, and corporate tax reform. So there's certainly a lot of uh, topics to discuss today. And we have a, a very distinguished panel um, with us today, uh, experts in the financial field, uh, who are going to give some remarks. And uh, after we uh, provide remarks, each panelist will provide about 10 minutes worth of remarks apiece. And after that, um, I'll uh, pose a couple questions as a moderator to get the uh, conversation rolling. And then we'll welcome uh, questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so let me introduce uh, today's panel in, in order of, uh, of speaker. Uh, we have the Honorable David Walker with us today. Uh, David is the uh, founder and uh, president and CEO of the Comeback America Initiative. Uh, in this capacity, David leads efforts to promote fiscal responsibility and sustainability uh, by engaging the public and assisting key policymakers on a nonpartisan basis to help achieve solutions uh, to America's federal, state, and local fiscal imbalances. Uh, prior to his position at CIA, uh, David uh, served as the uh, first president and CEO of the Peter Peterson Foundation. Uh, and previous to that, David uh, served um, as the seventh Comptroller General of the United States and the head of the U.S. Government Accountability Office uh, for almost 10 years, 1998 through 2008. Uh, David uh, was one of uh, three presidential appointments each by presidents during his uh, 15 years of total federal service. Uh, David has a wealth of uh, 20 years of uh, private sector experience, including 10 years as partner and global managing director of Human Capital Services uh, for Arthur Anderson. Also with us today is uh, Doug Schindenwolf, Executive Director of Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. Uh, Doug is a uh, Director of Tactical Asset Allocation for Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. He joined uh, Smith Barney's consulting group as a member of its Asset Allocation Committee in April 2000 and served as the committee's chairman uh, from September 2000 through uh, December 2005. Uh, prior to his uh, position at Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, uh, Mr. Schindenwolf held the position of a financial economist in the firm's research department uh, since 1986, and uh, before joining Citi, he worked at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York as an associate economist. And rounding out our panel today is Greg Giroux. 
Uh, Greg is an analyst with uh, Bloomberg Government, uh, focusing on Congress. Prior to joining Bloomberg uh, in June 2010, uh, Greg uh, worked for 14 years at Congressional Quarterly, uh, where he was senior writer specializing politics and elections, and helped write and edit seven editions of the Almanac uh, Politics in America. Uh, so you can see today we have a very distinguished panel. Um, I think perhaps maybe I'll turn it over to David, uh, who can provide an overview of the, uh, uh, the super committee, maybe uh, current happenings, and uh, some of his perspective um, on uh, how, this might, uh, how this might turn out for us. Uh, David? Thank you. Let me start with where we've been, where we are, where we're headed from a financial and fiscal standpoint, and then I'll touch on the super committee. The United States government has grown too big, promised too much, and waited too long to restructure. And the truth is, many state and local governments are in the same situation. The federal government was 2% of the economy in 1800. Now, the world was a different place, and the U.S. position in the world was different. But for the year just ended, September 30, 2011, it was 24% of the economy and it's headed for 37% of the economy on autopilot, absent a course correction, by 2040. In 2040, government would be a majority of the U.S. economy, absent a course correction. I'm not an anti-government person. Government has an important role to play. Some of the most capable, dedicated people I've ever worked with are public servants. But the fact is, government is not the engine of growth, innovation, and job creation. Uh, so, and if you look at our financial condition, it's much worse than advertised. We all know about the $1.3 trillion in deficit last year. We know about the $15 trillion in debt. But believe it or not, that's not the problem. The problem is what's off the balance sheet. Tens of trillions of dollars of unfunded promises for Medicare, Social Security, a range of other commitments and contingencies that don't represent deficits in debt today but will represent deficits and debt tomorrow, absent a course correction. Medicare, based upon reasonable and sustainable assumptions, $35 trillion underfunded. The recent Affordable Care Act uh, will cost us a lot of money if it's not ruled unconstitutional. The chief actuary of Medicare estimates it will cost $12 trillion more in discounted present value dollar terms than the politicians advertised. So if you look at where we are, that's one thing. If you look at where we're headed, we're headed for a fiscal cliff at breakneck speed, and we have a dysfunctional democracy, and I'll come back to that. And if you look at where we compare to others, if you want to benchmark us against other countries, you have to add federal, state, and local debt as a percentage of the economy. And when you do that, we're worse than some of the countries that are in the news. We're less than two years away from where Greece was when it had its crises. Uh, and if you look at rankings of countries with the Comeback America Initiative combined with Stanford University's master's programs has done, the Sovereign Fiscal Responsibility Index, it's like a fiscal fitness index. Number one's Australia, number 34 of all the countries that were done is Greece. The U.S. is an embarrassing 27, 20, 20, 28, I don't want to overstate it, 28. Italy's 27, Mexico's 18. Uh, the fact is, is that we need to wake up because while we're the largest economy, while the temporary sole superpower, while we have 60 plus percent of the world's global reserve currency, that gives us more time, stated differently, more rope. But not, we are not exempt from the laws of prudent finance. Now the super committee, in my view, not so super. The reason I say that is you got to look at the composition. Two of the 12 voted against increasing the debt ceiling limit. Where were these people? I mean, you know, that created the committee. Four of the 12 voted against Simpson Bowles. None of them voted for it. And all six of the Republicans have signed the Americans for Tax Reform Pledge. That's hardly a prescription for a go big grand bargain strategy. Furthermore, they're all appointees of the leadership. And quite frankly, the leadership has not been supportive of, of Simpson Bowles. Uh, in general terms, there's at least one exception, but in general terms has not been supportive, or at least two, I would say. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, people are, they're not likely to, to go big. I think they will ultimately hit their target of 1.2 trillion because they don't like the default mechanism. Uh, the question is, what will they do? How much creative accounting? 
and how credible will it be? And what I think is we got to realize is they have the ability not just to hit this $1.2 trillion target, which quite frankly wouldn't even qualify as a down payment on a mortgage today, given what our situation is. They have the ability to extend this extraordinary process, simple majority vote, no filibuster, no amendments, up or down, to create a second tranche effort no later than the end of 2013 to get a much bigger deal after the 2012 election. And I hope that's what they do. Although I also hope that it's not the same 12, that we end up reappointing new people uh, uh, for, for the next Congress after a citizen education engagement effort, which is necessary in order to facilitate the social insurance reforms and tax reforms that are necessary. Bottom line, we're in much worse shape than the politicians will tell you, but there's good news. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Sweden had fiscal crises in the 90s. They, came, they, they dealt with their challenge. If they can do it, we can do it. You can look at reforms proposed by Simpson Bowles, Domenici Rivlin, the Comeback America Initiative's Restoring Fiscal Sanity Report, which goes even further. You can look at those. There are ideas that can get this job done. The American people are ahead of the politicians. They get it. And let me tell you, if these people fail, there will be a big price to pay. There will be a big price to pay uh, because they're not doing their job. Uh, thank you, David. Um, uh, Doug, do you want to provide some perspective? Uh, obviously, this has a, uh, a lot of implications here for the financial markets, and I'd uh, be interested to get your read on uh, what uh, your, your perspective is on the Super Committee and the current fiscal situation. Sure. So I think David did a terrific job of, of outlining the, the scope of the problem in terms of the, the fiscal situation and, and the, the, the budget challenges that uh, confront us. <clears throat> what I'm going to do in my opening remark is, is just spend a few minutes uh, tying in how we view that as uh, relating back to the economic outlook. <clears throat> because the U.S. and global economies are facing some significant challenges uh, currently. Of one of which is the, uh, is the budget situation. But even before we get there, what we know from history is that recessions that were associated with financial crises produce deeper and longer recessions than the average or garden variety recession. And we saw that play out in the so-called Great Recession. More relevant to the current situation is that we also know from history that the recovery from recessions related to financial crises tend to be slower, you know, more sluggish, and, and, and don't contain that strong dynamic that usually uh, uh, exists coming out of recession. So that's one headwind that the U.S. and global economy um, are facing right out of the chute. On top of that, we have the fiscal situation. This is creating an additional headwind on the global and U.S. economy <clears throat> because uh, the response to very large budget deficits and or the accumulation over several years of very large uh, amounts of government debt outstanding have both a direct and indirect negative effect on the economy. The direct effect comes from the efforts that governments are taking to rein in the budget deficits. This is particularly the case in the periphery of, of Europe where they are either raising taxes or cutting spending and in most cases it's a combination of both now, while that may be the prescription for uh, the intermediate and long run, in real time, in the short run, while these changes are going into place, they're actually causing the, uh, an additional drag on the economy. So that's the negative direct effect. The indirect effect comes from the fact that there is this sense of policy disarray, that policymakers today are either incapable or unwilling to make the hard choices, and that creates sort of this cloud of uncertainty about the future. <clears throat> this sense that we're in, this, we're in a quagmire and it's very difficult to see the way out. So that cloud of uncertainty causes business and consumer confidence to suffer and that causes the indirect uh, hit to the economy. So to, the, to conclude, we, uh, we feel that this situation is, is a major contributor to the fact that we believe that Europe is in the early stages of a recession that is likely to persist through next year, and that in the case of the U.S., slipping back into recession, uh, we think is the most likely outcome over the course of the next year. Great, thank you, Doug. Um, 
Greg, uh, you have your finger on the pulse of Congress, if you will, and I'm sure you can lend some uh, good uh, political perspective and insight. And uh, what's the latest from Hill, uh, the Capitol Hill, and how are folks up there looking at this issue? Well, if I have my finger on the pulse, I don't know that I sense much of one yet right now, but uh, we'll see. They still have a few days left. Uh, just for intro, I approach this topic from the perspective of a congressional and political analyst who's watched Congress, politics, elections, and public opinion for the better part of 15 years, so I'll give my read on the environment through that prism. Um, as you know, time's ticking down on the super committee, uh, and uh, you know, as you know, you all know that, of course, and just like, you know, uh, from my favorite movies, uh, Colonel Renault in Rick's Cafe, I'm shocked, shocked that the, you know, the super committee is taking so long to, to come to an agreement here and waiting until the last minute. It's very tough to say what it will do. You know, sometimes I think a magic eight ball may provide more clairvoyance about this issue than you know, some of the stuff you're hearing from the principals. You hear guarded optimism or pessimism. Stories today talk about how you know, they're uh, really hardening their positions. But I do think you can't underestimate the uh, ability of Congress to you know, uh, put together something at the last minute in a slapdash fashion. It won't be pretty. It uh, won't even be a down payment, as David mentioned, but um, I think you know, they can probably get at least a baby step there. We've seen this happen with Congress before, where you know, something happened a week out. This happened with the debt, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the debt deal that created the super committee in the first place. About a week before uh, that became uh, law in the summer, uh, it looked pretty bleak that they'd come to an agreement. They came to one, and that created the super committee, and while we still have a few days left, you know, I still think that they can come to an agreement. That's my gut assessment is that they can get to at least a minimal agreement. Forget the, uh, the, the, the $4 trillion thing, uh, the, the, the big deal at this point. Um, you know, maybe that'll get done down the road, but with time uh, running out, I think a minimal 1.2 to 1.5 is probably where, where they're going to go. I think they'll do it, um, or at least I have uh, some guarded optimism they'll do it, in part because a deadline, you know, like a guillotine, the saying goes, is a way of focusing the mind. And uh, they don't want this $1.2 trillion of, of automatic cuts. No one wants them, especially to defense. We're hearing bipartisan opposition to that. So um, I think you know, they, they created the super committee with that, you know, that uh, disincentive that's uh, really appetizing to no one. Um, I, I do think that, I guess maybe I have guarded optimism will get something done in the sense that I think Congress you know, remembers it's not that long ago what happened during the financial crisis of 2008 and how that hit the markets and how their constituents responded to that. And I think they're going concerned about what's going on in Greece and Italy and they're mindful that, you know, that the debt crisis in Europe could have ripple effects in the United States. And while no member of Congress wants to vote for a bill that raises some of their constituents' taxes or cuts some of their federal benefits, they also don't want inaction to cause you know, make them, make their constituents pay more for houses and cars in the form of higher interest rates and uh, to see their 401ks plummet if the markets uh, have an adverse reaction. And I think one more reason why I think there's at least a glimmer of hope for a compromise is you're starting to see the parties kind of relax their, their you know, they're really hard negotiating positions from the beginning. The Republicans against any revenue, the Democrats for a trillion dollars or more. We're seeing the Republicans propose what they say is about $300 billion of new revenue, uh, mainly through kind of curbing some so-called tax expenditures. And the Democrats are, have kind of come down a little bit from their hard number. And you know, and the art of compromise, obviously, is you're not going to get 100% of what you want. You're not going to get 80% of what you want. So I think you know, that's, that's a hope for optimism. Having said all that, though, you know, whether they succeed or fail is you know, in the eye of the beholder. You know, um, if, if you see them you know, pass a 1.2 to 1.5 trillion dollar package and they declare success and go home for the holidays, well, as David mentioned, that's not much of a down payment at all. They still, they're just making a dent in a, a much bigger fiscal problem. And it's, it's just the, the bare minimum that they're going to be achieving if they just get to 1.2 trillion over 10 years. A couple words on public opinion. I think they may agree to something because I think the public is outraged. They have a, a very low approval rating of Congress you know, the Gallup poll uh, two days ago that came out had it at 13% approval. And my, uh, my first two thoughts on that were, you know, who are these 13%? And secondly, did the poll have a 13% margin of error? Um, but in other polls I've seen, you know, about 60% or so of people want the Congress to come to a compromise in the super committee, uh, even if it means kind of going against some of your core principles and meaning you have to compromise. Um, so and that's true of Democrats, Republicans, and independents as well. And so I think the public wants them to do it. 
Um, and uh, I don't think the Congress really wants to risk, you know, you know uh, advancing the ire of the public any more than it already is. You know, I, and I think that, you know, if you, if you asked voters about, you know, would you support higher taxes or cutting Social Security, they're going to, you know, they're, they're, if you ask them one by one, they're probably going to reject them all. But I think here the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, you know, I'm reminded of um, this, during the financial crisis of 2008, I'm reminded of this uh, Saturday Night Live weekend update skit that had uh, um, Jimmy Fallon interviewing a financial expert played by um, Kenan Thompson. And, um, he, and, you know, Jimmy Fallon was kept asking him questions, well, how do you propose to fix the financial crisis? And the answer that the financial expert played by Thompson always said was, fix it. And every time he'd ask a specific question, it was always, fix it, fix it, fix it. And I think that there's a, in all seriousness, I think there's a strand of that thought among the American people that they just want the super committee and the Congress to fix it. And I think they realize that they have to swallow some, you know, medicine now uh, to avoid what could be uh, bigger problems, you know, down the road. As David mentioned, you know, it's um, a big reason why it's so difficult to get this through um, is, you know, the super committee is, um, this is not a, a model of bipartisanship. These are people who are, you know, kind of line up with their parties on most of the major votes. You, not only does the super committee have to pass something, but you have to get it through the Congress as well, which is, you know, 242 Republicans in the House, 53 Democrats in the Senate. If you think, you know, getting a majority of 12 is hard, try 100, try 435. Um, having, um, I think if they, I think if they fail, I think there'll be obvious political consequences. Um, I, I think, you know, incumbents may want to, uh, you know, run for cover, and I think that the, the voters will probably project the failings of the super committee onto the Congress itself. Um, I don't think it'll be any fun for an incumbent to run in 2012 if they can't even, if the Congress and the super committee cannot even get this bare $1.2 trillion plan done. And if they succeed, I think, you know, the political fallout could be, you know, limited. I mean, I think it's very hard to, uh, for uh, the parties to attack one another if you have a bipartisan vote. Um, and I, you know, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but I remember, you know, the, the, the troubled asset relief program in 2008 passed right before the election. In the House, it had 172 Democrats vote for it, which is about three quarters, I believe, about 70%, and 91 Republicans, almost half. It was a bipartisan vote. The public didn't really like it, um, but, you know, the, the Congress came together to pass something that, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to kind of uh, stanch the problem. And yes, it became a campaign issue, but I don't think it was a career killer for anybody. And I think if there's a bipartisan vote for an agreement that has a mix of tax hikes and spending reductions, I don't think it's a career uh, killer either. So um, that's, I guess, how I see the lay of the land. I, um, uh, and I'm ready for any questions or comments you may have. Great, well, thank you, Greg. Uh, let me invoke a moderator privilege here and ask a couple questions of our panel. Um, I want to pick on, up on something that Doug had mentioned and something that we hear uh, often from uh, Tech America member company CEOs is, uh, gee, we, we want to see more certainty coming out of Washington, uh, especially when it comes to uh, how we uh, utilize the capital markets. Uh, and it sounds like uh, from David's comments that, uh, and our, the rest of our panel that $1.5 trillion is not necessarily um, a, a high goal to reach for when it comes to debt reduction. Uh, even with 10 years of uh, nominal GDP growth at 4.6%, uh, the debt would increase from $9 trillion to $20 trillion. Um, so if the super committee does meet their mark of $1.2, $1.5 trillion, uh, what's next? Um, should we hold them accountable in 2012, 2013? David, I know you have uh, some views on that. Uh, there was a bipartisan group uh, yesterday, uh, 150 members on both sides of the aisle advocating for a large-scale debt reduction plan, uh, anywhere between four and seven trillion, we've heard numbers. Uh, so I'd be curious to, um, to hear the panel's views on, uh, is 1.5 trillion en enough? And if not, what's next? Is there gonna be a super committee too? You wanna go first? No. Um, I believe that as, as I said before, this committee is not going to go big, but it's critically important that we go big, and there is nothing that precludes this super committee from meeting their target of 1.2 to 1.5 and recommending that a new body be created, doesn't necessarily have to be them, 
that would have the same rules, a simple majority, up or down vote, no amendments, no ability to filibuster, that no later than the end of 2013 there would be a second set of recommendations for much bigger deficit reduction, at least three trillion, uh, that would be accomplished through a combination of social insurance reforms, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, as well as comprehensive tax reform that would broaden the base, lower rates, lower top marginal tax rates, among other things, but that would generate more revenues uh, in a more intelligent fashion. I think you can do those together. In fact, politically, you'll probably have to do those together. Uh, and what I think is important to maximize the chance that that will get done is not only to recommend, recommend extending the extraordinary process, but a public engagement uh, and education campaign because what I have found, having gone to 49 states, is that the public is ahead of the politicians. When you provide the contextual sophistication and help them understand that we're talking about the future position of the United States in the world, our future standard of living at home, and quite frankly, the future domestic tranquility in our streets. When you put it on that basis and help them understand that we have no choice but to make tough choices, the question is, are we going to do it prudently, preemptively, or wait till the markets force us to? They get it. And so I see a clear way forward, and I'm hoping that the committee will follow that path. We'll find out next week. So I, you know, I, I think your original question was, is, is one and a half or 1.2 trillion enough? And clearly the answer is no, it's not enough to solve the deficit problem. Um, it's one and a half trillion over 10 years. The deficit is running at about that each year. Mm -hmm. So it's, nearly, it's not nearly enough, but it, it probably is enough to keep the credit rating agencies from further downgrading the, the rating on the, on the Treasury debt, which is an important aspect here too, because it will at least show that there is incremental progress being made on deficit reduction, and I think that they'll read that as sufficient for now for not uh, downgrading the debt. I think it'll be interesting to see what the uh, super committee, if it comes to a deal, instruct, you know, has the, you know, instructs, the, you know, future committees and congresses to do. It could have instructions about how to, you know, overhaul the tax code or, in, or instruct the, the tax writing committees to take a look at corporate tax overhaul, for example. But to answer your question, yes, it's obvious that 1.2 to 1.5 is not enough. Uh, this is a deficit reduction committee, not a debt reduction committee. Uh, keep that in mind, and you still need to get well above that, probably over four trillion before you begin to stabilize the, the debt to GDP ratio. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, uh, part of our panel today is about um, government spending. Um, and I'd like to get the panel's insights about what you think about the overall status of the appropriations process. Uh, our federal government agencies, are, with their spending, they're relying on continuing re resolutions. We have one up very soon, um, and omnibus bills. Uh, is Congress uh, capable of passing standalone appropriations bills any longer? And I, I think part of this has to do with the uh, current uh, state of the, the super committee. Um, so when agencies and others uh, are looking at the normal appropriations process and the super committee is a rather unique legislative mechanism, um, what does it say about the, uh, the fiscal process of Congress and, and the regular appropriations process? You always, you always start? Uh, mm -hmm. Under the Constitution, which unfortunately uh, is not followed to the extent that it should be, uh, the Congress is supposed to pass annual appropriations bills uh, and uh, also, starting in 1974, uh, have a budget that would guide a passage of those appropriations bills. For two years in a row, the Congress has not passed a joint budget resolution. Uh, only two years out of 25 years, the last 25 years, has Congress passed all the required appropriations bills uh, before the beginning of the fiscal year. That's a .080 batting average, hardly major league. Uh, I'm also part of the No Labels political movement, uh, and we're going to come out with some proposed congressional reforms uh, on December 13th, and one of them will be if Congress does not pass a budget and appropriations bills by the beginning of the fiscal year, they should not get paid. And they should not be able to get retroactive pay. 
Uh, and the other thing, the last thing I'll say here is, believe it or not, the House just issued its schedule. It's only going to work 109 days next year. 109 days. It's an outrage. Yeah, the only thing I, I guess I would add is, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> you know, watching Congress, they're passing what, continuing resolution after continuing resolution, CR has entered the, uh, you know, kind of like the, the government uh, alphabet soup argument, you know, and not for, not for a good reason. You know, the, the House has been today on passing another continuing resolution. So we, yeah, as, as David mentioned, we've had years where we haven't had uh, budget resolutions, you know, the, the budget blueprints that you're supposed to abide by. We don't pass appropriations bills on times, and we've had just a, it seems like an endless series of, you know, uh, Band-Aid continuing resolutions. It doesn't, it doesn't inspire confidence, and it doesn't uh, give a lot of certainty to people uh, who have a stake in it. All right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, we've covered a lot of issues today. Uh, I'd like to open up uh, uh, the questions to the floor. And if I can request that you please provide your name and organization, um, we'd uh, like to take questions now, please. Mark Poole, Tower Swanson Investment Services. Uh, I guess I was expecting that the, the Supercommittee was going to have to send something to the Congressional Budget Office to kind of score these things. So my mind, I'm thinking they're already late, but maybe I misunderstand that. But it was, uh, let me say, if they actually pass something, but it's through uh, tricky accounting, uh, and then when it gets scored or when it becomes clear later that they don't actually uh, produce the results that they wanted, what would be the potential fallout to the market? So I guess to Greg, maybe, what's my misunderstanding about the timeline? And then to others, what would be the impact on the markets? Yeah, I'll take the part on the um, timeline and let the others uh, address the other parts of your question. Appreciate it. Um, the, uh, the deadline is uh, November 23rd for the district to make the vote, but there is, uh, you have to allow 48 hours for them to come up with a proposal to give to the budget uh, scores just to make sure that, you know, just to come out with the, spit out the number. So really their deadline is Monday the 21st to allow that 48 hour uh, window until the, the vote can occur no later than November the 23rd. Um, but so here we are on Thursday, they really have until Monday. Um, CEO, it, it, takes, it takes a while to kind of crunch the numbers on these large bills. But uh, the CEO is working pretty closely with the super committee. They're, you know, they're starting to, I guess, a lot of the proposals that are being bandied around, the CEO has already scored, prepared to score so that they can do it on an expedited basis. You know, they, I think they did this with the health care bill. They, they, did, they didn't take as, as long as they you may have, normally would have uh, with their scoring. But still, uh, it's Thursday and they have to really get it done by Monday. So you're, uh, you're, you're right that uh, the deadline really is on Wednesday because they have to allow that 40 hours. I'll respond to the uh, potential market reaction aspect. Um, you're, you're certainly right that it's not just the size of the package that they come up with, but the elements and the credibility of the elements that make up the total size is going to affect the market's impact. <clears throat> but a lot of things go into how the markets react. And I think, actually, one of the big factors uh, in terms of the initial reaction is what impact is this plan likely to have on the economy in the short run? And I say that because current policy has entrained some fiscal drag that's going to start uh, hitting the economy early next year unless action is taken to unwind that. Specifically, there was a temporary payroll tax cut that went into effect at the beginning of this year that expires at the end of this year. That will roll off unless it's extended. The extended unemployment benefits program will roll off at the end of the year unless that's extended. There are other provisions that are expiring from the fiscal stimulus package that will roll off next year. In total, that amounts to about a drag of about 2% of GDP next year. Now what we think is that the, the uh, payroll tax and the unemployment benefits will probably be extended and that will reduce the drag to about 1% of GDP. But it's still drag next year. So back to your question, whether or not the super committee addresses the payroll tax expiration and the unemployment benefits expiration may have a big influence on how the market responds to their proposal. It's possible that they'll roll in the extensions into their proposal, but if they do, they're going to have to make the cuts that much bigger to hit their 1.2 trillion target. 
So if they don't address it, it'll be left to the, the Congress to enact it or extend these by the end of the year. But that kind of a combination would probably produce a, um, a negative reaction in the financial markets, I think. If they don't extend those provisions, and that means fiscal drag is, is, uh, is coming early next year. As a certified public accountant and a former auditor general of the United States, I'm uh, accustomed to seeing people try to use creative accounting, especially in this town. First, they've got to decide what are they going to use as a basis to keep score. In other words, what baseline are they going to use? The current law baseline after the deficit reduction deal, after the, the debt ceiling increase deal that was done in August, is about $3.2 trillion in deficits over the next 10 years. The one before that was about 4.5. The current policy baseline is about 9 trillion. And then President Obama's baseline was 10.4 trillion. So first, on what basis are you going to keep score? All right? Because that's a credibility issue right there. Generally, the CBO is going to go based on current law. They're also not going to consider dynamic scoring. In other words, to what extent does it stimulate the economy? And therefore, you might get more than under a static situation. Uh, I think you also have to say, well, what are the components of how they get to the 1.2 to 1.5, all right? Uh, for example, if you merely uh, say that we're going to take our troops in Southwest Asia down to 45,000 by 12:31, 2014, that's a trillion dollars over 10 years as compared to current law. Now, that would not be viewed as credible, if it, in my view, if it was part of the 1.2 to 1.5. If, on the other hand, you were able to do things to get real 1.2, 1.5, and then add that on top, all right, as gravy rather than as an element, I think that would be an acceptable thing and a positive thing to do. Uh, the other thing they can frankly do is, if you want to get more detail, is they don't want the sequester, they don't want the automatic sequester, take half of it. And then figure out how you're going to figure do the other half. And to do that, it's going to have to be on mandatory. It's going to be on have to be on mandatory spending and on the revenue side. And we might get into that. There is a path forward for them to hit 1.2 to 1.5 uh, without comprehensive tax reform, without comprehensive social security reform, uh, and even do more if you do the thing on Southwest Asia. Uh, there's a pathway forward. The question is, will they do it? Charles Colligan of CoStar Group. My question is regarding any potential cuts and whether those cuts would disproportionately impact certain sectors of the economies or regions of the country. For example, might we see a reduction in government employee in government employment in the Washington region? You guys want to start? I haven't analyzed the details of it. Most people will tell you that the way that they would try to handle it first is through hiring freezes uh, and through not, not replacing uh, rather than layoffs. Uh, I haven't run the numbers to find out whether or not that in fact will get the job done. Uh, but I think we also have to recognize that just as many state and local governments have huge unfunded obligations for pension, retiree health obligations and other things, so does the federal government. Uh, and in the absence of restructuring those types of obligations, you know, you don't have a whole lot of options but headcount. Uh, you know, I mean, after you look at contractors. And so that's why I'm saying we need to take a more holistic approach uh, because in many cases what we've done is, you know, we're taking short-term steps, we're treating the symptoms, we're not treating the disease. Uh, we need to start focusing on the disease. If I would just piggyback on that and just point out that state and local governments have been confronted with balancing their budget by, by constitution and one of the ways that they've been doing it is through headcount reduction. Uh, declines in employment at the state and local government level have been a persistent pattern over the last several months in our employment data. Hey, hey, yes, sir. John Yeppin, Capital Bay Group. Can we go from macro to micro and talk about what that means to our portfolios, both now and you know, into the future, I just got through reading Fareed Zakaria's book, Post-American World, and, you know, he's contrasting Great Britain back when the sun never set on the British Empire and looking into China and India. Um, a report that uh, Morgan Stanley just put out said 80% of the growth, uh, future growth of the world would be in emerging markets. 
So should we be adjusting our portfolios to take uh, advantage of those sea changes in growth? How does the U.S. position relate now and then into the future? So I guess the way I would answer that is uh, from an investment perspective, we always encourage diversification in your, in your portfolio, um, in large part because no one really can predict the future with 100% accuracy. So you have to hedge yourself against many different outcomes. Now, in the case of region, the way we would regionally allocate a portfolio within, within stocks, uh, certainly one way to do it, uh, and, and this is actually the way we prefer, is to start from a, uh, an allocation that we would describe as not incorporating a home country bias toward the US or any other country. And so what that means is structuring a portfolio where the, the equity allocation is in proportion to each country or each region's share of the global stock market. Now, in the case of emerging markets, because you brought that up, <coughs> that's a good example. Um, in 1990, the emerging markets represented about 2% of the global stock market. That share has grown in the past 20 years to about 13%. So showing the, the strong growth dynamic in these countries and these economies. We think that kind of trend will continue into the future. So emerging markets definitely play a, uh, a strong role in our portfolio diversification recommendations for that reason. Do we take into consideration the growth rate of emerging markets at 6 7% versus developed countries at 2%? Do we look into the future or are we looking at what is their relative share of global GDP now? And I just recall back, I got in the business, it was like 1981, Japan was maybe 30% of the world's global GDP or some big number like that. And it's, I don't know, maybe 7% today. Right, well, we, we look at both. We look at history and we look at expectations. And so we know, again, using the emerging market example, we know that historically, their market share, again, this is not GDP share per se, although that would be similar, looking at share of global, the global stock market capitalization has grown from 2% to 13% over the last 20 years. So the only way for that to have happened is that these markets have grown in size relative to other markets. And of course, a big part of that is the growth dynamic in their underlying economies, which we expect to continue into the future. But what I hear you asking is, uh, all right, do you, add, do you do your asset allocation on the 13% or, you, or do you have something more than 13% because you expect that to outgrow? Uh, or is that what you're asking? Yes. All right, well, I'm not a registered investment advisor, so I'm not going to answer you. <laughs> <laughs> but there may be somebody else. <laughs> all right, so I'll, I'll pick up on that. <laughs> we start with the 13%. But then we are, uh, also make recommendations on a shorter term, what we would call a tactical horizon. And that can either be an overweight or an underweight, depending on our view. In the case of emerging markets, it is an overweight. So in our tactical view, we are going beyond that 13%. And that incorporates the, the, the one big factor in that is the expectation that the growth dynamic, the growth numbers in these emerging economies is going to continue to outstrip the growth rate in developed economies, especially since we think most developed economies are going to be in recession within the next year. Uh, other questions for the audience, please raise your hand. Uh, gentleman here in the uh, fourth row in the middle. You have a microphone. Larry Bruiser, Mitsui USA. Um, Recently, a lot of Repub well, some Republicans are starting to get restive over Grover Norquist's pledge and how this might get in the way of debt reduction. Uh, do you think this is a significant movement, or is uh, Norquist going to still hold sway over the party? Well, first, my personal view is there should be no pledges to special interest groups, period, whether they be on the right or the left and that anybody who's willing to make a pledge to a special interest group is basically elevating that special interest group over their duty of loyalty to the country. Uh, and the simple fact of the matter is when you look at the, no the numbers as to where we are, you can't grow your way out, you can't inflate your way out, you can't just tax your way out, you can't just cut your way out, so everything's going to have to be on the table. Secondly, when you look at Grover's pledge, he's got two. 
One is for state and local government, which is basically no new taxes, all right, no, no tax increases, no tax increases. That's not what it is for the federal government. For the federal government, it says two things. You will not raise marginal tax rates, and secondly, you will not reduce deductions, exemptions, credits, and exclusions unless it's coupled with a reduction in marginal tax rates. That begs the question, compared to what? Compared to current level of revenues? Compared to historical, historical level of revenues? Or compared to current law level of revenues? That's why what I argue is, let's do comprehensive tax reform. Let's compare it to current law. If you do that, under current law, revenues are going to 23.3% of GDP by 2035. That's too high. So let's compare it to current law with a restructured tax system and let's cap it at 205 to 21.5% of GDP. And on that basis, that's called a tax cut as compared to current law. So part of the issue is, is people frankly have to understand what they've signed. And, and you know, No Labels, one of the groups that I'm involved with, has called, for, has called for elected officials to rescind and reject all special interest projects, whether it be ATRs or there's some on the left dealing with Social Security and Medicare. Those are just as bad. Uh, people that sign those things are part of the problem. They're not part of the solution. And the only, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just quickly agree with David's first point, which is just basically that because of the size of the problem, I think all options have to be you know, part of the solution. That it's, it's too big to fix just from spending constraint without introducing some kind of tax increase in tax revenue as part of the solution. And for any, I would only add that for anything to pass, I mean, you have to have people who have signed the Norquist Pledge, uh, I mean, for something to pass, people who have signed the Norquist Pledge have to vote for it. I mean, you have 242 Republicans in the House. I think all but six of them maybe have, have signed the pledge. And, you know, a, a, a few weeks ago, there was a, a letter signed by about 40 Republicans and 60 Democrats in the House um, that basically said, you know, super committee go big, put revenues on the table, and spending as well. These are not, you know, Rockefeller Republicans. These are, um, these are you know, I'd, I'd say all of them, if not all of them, or, or most of them, have, had signed the Norquist Pledge. And um, I think they realize that everything has to be on the table for something to work. Uh, one of the, the, the chief Republican signatory to that letter was a Republican from Idaho named Mike Simpson, who uh, told uh, Bloomberg's Al Hunt in an interview a couple weeks ago that, about the pledge, I didn't realize I was signing a marriage vow here. Um, so, you know, I think for the numbers to work, for something to pass a Republican House and a Democratic Senate, um, you, people are going to have to, uh, people who have signed the pledge will have to, uh, you know, uh, kind of buck Grover Norquist. You also have to look at when they signed it. You know, in 1998, when I became Comptroller General of the United States, uh, we, were, we were at surplus. We were moving to surplus, okay? In 2000, we had projected surpluses as far as the eye could see. People were saying that we were gonna pay off all the national debt. I didn't think, frankly, for a nanosecond that we would pay off all the national debt because I know how this place works, okay? And look at where we are now as compared to where we were, were then, all right? And so people need to rescind and reject these pledges. It's as simple as that, whether it's on the right or the left. And the, and the public, frankly, ought to be demanding that they do that. A uh, question in the back row. Hi, I'm Tom Rignanti with Citibank. Um, I have a political question for Greg. Um, it has to do with divided government. Um, it seems like in the past where we've had um, divided government, but we've had issues come up. Um, we've had um, leaders on both sides get together um, and and solve some fiscal problems. You know, thinking of uh, Reagan and um, Tip O'Neill with tax reform in the 80s, even uh, Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich with um, some Medicare reform in the 90s. But who are the leaders today, you know, as you're following the Hill, you know, who's, who's, who are the leaders that are emerging that um, are the compromisers? Um, you know, the public doesn't seem to see that. You know, who's, are they talking to the White House? Is the president um, talking to certain leaders of Congress and, and you know, what, what is your view of who the leaders are that are going to make things happen or, or not? Yeah, well, the, the Congress is a, a much different place than it was 20 or 30 years ago. It's become a lot more polarized. Um, that owes for a lot of reasons. I mean, you have um, uh, essentially a Congress that, uh, you know, the Republicans are mostly, you know, conservative, right of center, use your favorite word. Democrats, mostly liberal, progressive, use your favorite word there, too. You don't have much of a middle anymore. You know, back... Um, 
uh, you used to have a, a large, vibrant, uh, you know, uh, moderate Republican wing in the Northeast, and you had a large kind of group of moderate to conservative Democrats in the South, and um, you don't have that anymore. You have uh, uh, two parties that, um, you know, that have, I think, very stark philosophical differences, probably starker than I've seen in a long time. So it's very hard to bridge those differences when, uh, you, uh, when you have the two parties as far apart as they are. Um, as far as like who the leaders are, who the, uh, you know, the, the, the people prone to compromise, um, I think, you know, I think that I think the hundred members of the, of the, of the, uh, the House that I mentioned who signed that letter, I think you have 45 senators who signed a similar letter. I think among that group, there's no one, there's not a, like a group of people that really stand out to me. I think, you know, that I think the gang of six really, I think, helped move the conversation forward and the ball forward because you had, you know, uh, people, um, you know, put, they put their name on a plan, a much bigger plan, and they, and they voted for it. You had people on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the Bowles-Simpson Commission who, um, who, uh, who voted for a, a, a big deal plan of $4 trillion or more, who uh, had to, um, you know, go against their uh, party's philosophy on a, on a, uh, on a number of things. Um, so, but it, I don't think it's a very long list of people in the Congress. I would respectfully suggest mm -hmm. the gang of six which are three Democrats and three Republicans. The Blue Dog Democrats, uh, the Republican Main Street Coalition, which is the Tuesday group. Now the problem is, they're actually smaller now than they were in the last Congress. Because what's happening is, because of, because of gerrymandering of districts, uh, you don't have that many competitive districts. And the ones that are competitive are the ones that you know, tend to have people that are more sensible center people who are more willing to compromise, all right, if you will. And so that's why we need redistricting reform. We need integrated and open primaries. We need campaign finance, finance reform. And I also think we need uh, 12 to 18 year term limits. Let me just mention one other thing. There's another difference. You had presidential leadership. And you had a willingness to come together to do what was right for the country. But frankly, the last time we did enti major entitlement reform was Social Security, and that wasn't a great degree of leadership because the checks weren't going to go out on time within a matter of months. They had no choice. They had to do something. The so-called trust fund, which is a trust the government fund, was about, to go, was about to go dry. All right? And so they had to do something. But if you look at Bush 41 and you look at Clinton, they demonstrated leadership, budget controls, no expansion of entitlements, you know, changed campaign promises on, tax, uh, on, on taxes when they saw they were responsible. It's not a partisan thing. It's a matter of leadership, and it's a matter of putting the country's interest before partisan and ideological interests. Uh, David, you made a, an in interesting point, and I, I had an important one that I don't want to get lost um, in today's discussion. Uh, you mentioned a public education campaign and, um, uh, and lack of support on Capitol Hill for the Bowles Simpson Commission recommendations. Uh, do you think that's because the political fortitude is not there and, and looking at lessons learned from the European Union, um, do you think that a public education campaign will take place during the presidential campaign when we look at entitlement reform and tax reform? Uh, will, the, uh, will President Obama and the future Republican nominee um, address these issues? Will they have an honest, uh, sobering, intellectual conversation with the American public? And if so, is the American public ready for it? Number one, I would hope so, but you can't count on it. All right? It's clearly not going to happen in the primary, and there's only one primary. That's a Republican primary. Secondly, I think we need to learn from history, and we need to learn from others. And when you talk about public education, President Clinton wanted to reform Social Security in 1999 and he went about it the right way. He partnered with AARP, the Concord Coalition, America Speaks, myself and others, to start doing selected public education engagement efforts, fact-based, nonpartisan, with Democrats and Republicans observing, not giving political speeches, elected officials observing while the professionals were conducting the thing, all right? Combined with private discussions inside of Washington, we would have had Social Security reform in 1999, but for the blue dress incident. I won't go any further. Uh, you know, all we need to do is look at what's worked in the past. We don't, it's not rocket science. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here, okay? But that comes back to what I said before. You need leadership. 
just add that sure. I, I think the uh, upcoming presidential debates are likely to be the forum for this sort of public education. I, I, I can't imagine that the question won't come up. I can even see an entire debate, because there are probably going to be several, devoted just to this topic. So I, I think that will happen. The problem, I think, though, is that both sides have put forward plans to address the problem. The, the, so there's no shortage of plans to reduce the deficit. The problem is no one plan has enough support to be enacted. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really, so I don't, I don't think the airing of the plans is gonna be any, break any new ground. It's, you know, can, you know, and I think, I think it's only the election outcome that can actually change the odds of something actually being put in place. And I think it really comes down to the end of divided government as the best hope for something actually being enacted. Can I, can I, this, sure. the presidential uh, and vice presidential debate schedule, I think has already been announced. Mm -hmm. There's only two presidential debates. There's two. And there's one vice presidential debate. It, it, there's no way you're going to be able to cover all this stuff. I mean, anybody been watching these debates lately? There's not exactly a lot of public education uh, and engagement involved in them, okay? And so the fact is, is that yes, I agree with you that they will be part of the debates. And I think it's critically important that they be with regard to the general election. But realistically, we're not going to get much out of that. I mean, the fact is, is that you need to be able to, ha you need to, be able to convince the American people, which is possible because I've done it in 49 states and, and they get it. You're on a burning platform. We are on a burning platform. We have no choice but to make dramatic transformational changes. And, and once, once, you, once you're there, then you can have a more constructive discussion about, okay, well, now we're going to have to renegotiate the social insurance contracts. We're going to need more revenues. We're going to have to reduce defense spending without compromising national security. Let's figure out how we go about doing that. We're going to have to do it as a package. We're going to have to do it in installments. We're going to have to phase it in over time so you don't undercut economic recovery and exacerbate our unemployment. I mean, you know, people are a lot smarter than, than people give them credit for. When you tell them the truth, when you give them the facts, uh, and when you help them understand that doing nothing is just flat not an option. Uh, yes, in the front. Adam, Adam Goddard with uh, Morgan Stanley. Uh, question for the panel, but overall, is I, I, I'm in a quandary and kind of uh, my take is this. You have so much uncertainty right now, okay, which is causing stagnation to the economy. It's also causing a drag on the wealth effect of the market. If you push some kind of compromise reform through, you end that, most of that uncertainty and cause an increase in the wealth effect okay, and an increase in business because now businesses don't feel so uncertain. So if I'm in Congress and know that at least if I get something decent accomplished, even if I don't get exactly what I want, the net benefit to the economy and to the, to the financial markets is so much greater, why would I want to sit here and dig in my position when at the end I'm going to end up at a net net loss? I, I just can't get over that. Because it's about politics, <laughs> okay? and because there's an election next year, and because the White House is in play, and because the Senate is in play, and because the House may even be in play, all right? Uh, and, and it's because, uh, you know, quite frankly, uh, there are a lot of good people in elected office, but there's too many that have never had a real job in the real world. They don't understand how the real world works, uh, and they desperately want to hold on to their job. And so they're hesitant to be able to tell people the truth. They're hesitant to talk about what the solutions are because they think people can't handle the truth. They can handle the truth, all right? So you're exactly right. I mean, there's great uncertainty. You know, if we could get a deal that would provide more certainty on taxes, that would provide more certainty in regulatory, we could get the trillions of dollars of cash that's sitting on the balance sheets doing nothing, you know, to work. You know, we could get people to start making investments, uh, and it would help. That's why I'm saying, you know, but let's be real. There is an election in 2012, so let's get as much done as we can, and let's put a process in place that will allow us to do, be able to do much more as soon as possible, but no later than the end of 2013. Uh, can I ask our host in the back to give a time check? Do we have time for a couple more questions? Okay. Any other questions in the audience, please? Uh, yes, gentlemen in the front row. Hi, good morning. 
Uh, Maurice Lethbridge. I work for an international technology company based here in Washington as well as in London. Um, I want to touch on a couple points you, you, uh, the panel has brought up regarding education and also it's not going to happen here. There was a Pat Oliphant cartoon in the Washington Post a couple of days ago which had an image of a hospital ward. On the right were the Greeks, on the left were the Americans. In the middle you had the Italians, the Euro and Europe. And there was measles spreading from right to left. I don't know if you may have seen it. But the American is holding a pamphlet which said homegrown recipes or homegrown remedies, I think it was, which is the super committee. I mean, they're busy running around inside of their own head with respect to this. And the Europeans are all looking at each other going, I'm, I don't want to catch what he's got. But the American the image of Uncle Sam was his homegrown remedies. What is it going to take for the American government, A, to educate our people that you need to look at what's going on on the other side of the pond, and to also to realize that what's going on on the other side of the pond could happen here, and to educate people that if it does happen here, to your point, David, we're in a whole heap of trouble. Well, I, I mentioned the effort that President Clinton took in 1998, where he, uh, he, he used town hall type forms of, re, uh, of statistically representative groups of citizens from those communities. So you, know, you had a good sense uh, uh, as to who it was. But today, we now have so many more capabilities technologically, OK? The web is much more robust. We have social networking. We have so many other things at our disposal today that could be possible. Uh, let me tell you something else that's being talked about now, and I don't know whether or not this will become a reality or not, but I've been recently approached about the possibility of doing a people's primary. And the people's primary would be along the lines of American Idol, but for public policy issues, to, to be able to have an education and engagement effort and to try to draw upon people who are knowledgeable you know, from all three sectors of the economy to actually engage in a meaningful discussion and debate about public policy issues as a supplement to the presidential campaigns where you typically get partisan rhetoric, talking points, ideological things, all right? Uh, and so one of the things you got to think about is that how can you go outside the box? How can you do things that will reach millions of Americans, all right? Uh, in ways that might engage them uh, because right now on television quite frankly and on radio we have too many fact-free zones we have people with lots of opinions typically the right and the left but very few facts but if you look at the Arab Spring, yeah yeah the Arab Spring social network was driven by social Absolutely. network you've got this Occupy Wall Street crowd yeah and you would have thought I think most people in the room were kind of, oh, maybe this has some potential to be a voice of America. But it died. And it, it didn't spread through social network. And as somebody who's new, a new American, there is this sense of culture here, as in it won't happen here. I don't need to worry about it. And they're wrong. Right, it, they're it wrong. It's going to happen here. But wh yeah. why, why don't we as a, a country, and you guys are thought leaders, why didn't the rest of the country get behind Occupy Wall Street through social media. Why didn't it take off? Why didn't it become like the Arab Spring? Because Occupy Wall Street was a manifestation of dissatisfaction in several ways. High unemployment, higher underemployment, declining real wage growth, growing gap between the haves and the have-nots in many different ways, all right? Shrinking middle class, all right? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, the federal government provided hundreds of billions of dollars for bailouts and nobody has been held accountable for what happened. I mean, there were good reasons for Occupy Wall Street to happen, just as there were good reasons for the Tea Party to happen. But if you don't have an agenda, you're going nowhere. You're going nowhere. You've got to support. You've got to know yeah. Uh, other questions from our audience? Uh, yes, gentlemen in the back on the side, please. My name is Eric Stewart. I host a radio show called The Eric Stewart Show on WMAL. Yesterday, I was at the Cato Institute all day for a monetary policy meeting, and uh, Ron Paul was speaking about 
I'll just, the gist of it was he didn't have a lot of optimism that the super committee was going to accomplish what they set out to do. I'd be interested if you think that will happen and what we can do to spur them on. Let me some, somebody else. Super committee, right. Greg, do you want to start? Maybe yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I have to agree that there aren't many signs of optimism right now. I think, uh, um, you know, the, the parties, I think the, the storyline you're seeing today, you know, four or five days before the deadline is the, the parties are kind of, uh, you know, uh, sticking to their guns. But, you know, for some of the reasons I outlined, I, I just have a, a gut feeling that they'll, they'll get the absolute minimum done. Um, one being the, uh, I think they, they realize what happened in 2008, what happened with the markets, um, that they don't want these automatic cuts to go into effect, even though they won't go into effect. Uh, for a year, and they, the, you know, one poll I saw, CNN poll I saw a couple days ago showed that 78% of the public either thought it very unlikely or somewhat unlikely that the super committee would not come to an agreement. Now, when 80% of the public thinks you're not even going to get the bare minimum, you have a big image problem. <laughs> and I, I think they want to do this just to provide some assurance to the American people that they can get something done. Um, Yes, time's ticking out, but um, I, 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 really think, uh, I really think they're aware of the, uh, of the economic and political consequences of not coming to an agreement. I would, I would add <clears throat> that it has become an obsession of, of the financial markets to try to anticipate these political the decisions of these political bodies going back to Congress in August about the debt ceiling and how that would turn out. And, numerous times over the past year in terms of how the European discussions are going to turn out, now with the super committee. And I can tell you the effect on financial markets has been a dramatic increase in volatility to the point where it is really scaring away individual investors from the market. I believe that ultimately they will hit the minimum. The question is how much more and how creative accounting and credible their things are. Because I think they recognize not only do they not want the uh, automatic cuts to come into place, uh, but they recognize that the capital markets would likely respond very adversely if they didn't, uh, and secondly, the American people would likely respond very adversely if they didn't. Look, this place is badly broken, meaning Washington, D.C. I don't think it's that badly broken. Uh, and let me tell you, if, if they don't reach some kind of a deal, I'm worried for us. Well, I want to uh, thank everybody for uh, attending today's session. I'd like to thank our panel, Greg, David, and Doug. Uh, I'd like to thank our partners, the uh, Capital Bay Group and Bloomberg Government. Uh, this webcast will be uh, also available on uh, Tech America's website and on Bloomberg Government's website. Uh, and thank you for coming today.